For thousands of years, humans have tried to best each other in combat. But other animals have been doing this for millions of years, and they come equipped with their own weapons. So, if you look across animals, just about any species of animal has weapons of one type or another, but most of the weapons stay pretty small. But here and there are animal species that just break these rules, and the structures they produce are huge. That's Doug Emlin. He's a biologist at the University of Montana, and he specializes in these extreme weapons, mainly in rhinoceros beetles. But we'll get back to these little guys in a minute. Extreme structures are disproportionately large for a given animal. If you're wondering what some of these extreme weapons may look like, look no further than moose, bighorn sheep, and fiddler crabs. And so, and so the weapons can be as much as 30% of the body weight of an animal. And again, to put that in perspective, because we're not used to thinking about that, that would be like you or me producing another leg and wearing it around on our head for our entire adult life. So I happen to have a little guy here. I can show you what we're talking about. And we're interested in why they have them, how they use them. And we get into a lot of the sort of lifting up the hood and looking at the, the nitty gritty inside, the, the development and the evolution of these extreme structures, weapons, and we do it in beetles. Beetles count for about 40% of all insect species in the world and 30% of all animal species. There are a lot of beetles out there. At some level, for a lot of us in biology, everything comes back to diversity. We're interested in differences among species and, and the variation that you see out there in life. And it's pretty hard to look at diversity and not instantly fall in love with beetles. We start talking about these weapons that in many of the animal species, what's going on is these are situations where the males have the weapons and the females don't. In these populations, on one side you have all these males ready to hook up, but there aren't a whole lot of females to choose from. And that unbalance, Doug says, creates competition, it creates a backdrop for intense fights among males. For example, a male rhinoceros beetle will land on the side of a tree. Where there are sort of nicks or wounds on the bark where sap oozes out, and that's a territory. Because the females like to feed on sap. Before going off to lay their eggs, and the males plant themselves at these things. They fight with all the other males that come in. They use their weapons in battles. And in the main species that we work on, the horns on a male literally look like a pitchfork. They, they come in front of the head of the male, they stick out in front of the animal. The males will try to get their pitchfork underneath the opponent and flip them off the tree. It throws them down to the ground below. That male goes off in search of another territory, and the male that wins the fight stands guard and mates with the females that come to that resource to feed. Other species have horns that act like clamps that grab and throw the opposing male to the ground. There's all kinds of weapons in these beetles, and that's just one group. This is just the rhinoceros beetles. Strength matters, and sometimes a fight will look like it's about to start, and one just knows it's not strong enough. It won't even try. Then there comes the question, what makes this beetle over here bigger than that beetle over there? So in insects, the, the thing that is the most important for determining whether you're one of that really, really big, super high quality animal or the really runted little tiny guy is nutrition. So the insects who get the most nutrition in their diet? They're in the best condition, they're resistant to parasites, they're not sick. Or the bigger, meaner looking weapons. You know, these are the guys for whom all the stars lined up perfectly and they are in the best condition possible. One of the functions that work here, Doug suspects, are insulin signaling pathways. Every multicellular type of animal you can think of has insulin signaling as sort of one of its core physiological mechanisms that we know is connected to metabolic syndrome and diabetes, is connected to aging. We're looking at yet another facet of this same pathway that's been, I mean, essentially utterly unexplored. It's not what most people think of when they think of insulin, and yet we're showing it may be this widespread mechanism that's prevalent in everything from crabs to antlers to beetle horns that's regulating the growth of lots of body parts, and in particular, these super sensitive parts like the weapons. As cool as these insects are, Doug believes there is more to be learned about these small creatures apart from biology. There is a connection in the way that these animals use and develop these large weapons that really can be applied to how humans get wrapped up in these huge arms races. Once you take that sort of leap in logic, the parallels, they just fall into place. The, the kinds of things that spark an arms race in our technologies where suddenly 
bigger weapons are better. And each side is racing the other to get the bigger, faster, more expensive, more state-of-the-art weapon. And you start cycling into something where the weapons get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's totally parallel to what we're learning about in the animal.